You're listening to this broadcast on the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' Abbey Road album, which came out in 1969, just after, two years after Sgt. Pepper. Now for me, a person of my age, that was one of the most memorable events of my life because it changed the whole culture of pop music forever. Um, it's gone downhill since then, of course. Uh, but uh, one, of the, uh, one of the tracks on Here Comes the Sun, on, uh, on Abbey Road, is called Here Comes the Sun with George Harrison. Okay? And I'm sure, certainly every European, every, I'm sure most Russians know the tune. I'm not going to sing it for you, but um, it's got wonderful, beautiful tune. And a few years ago, I thought, it's strange that he should have come up with that, because at that time, I started my own research on the interaction between genetics and sunlight. And I actually worked on snails, and that seems a very strange thing to work on. In some ways, that refers to something I've talked about in another one of these broadcasts, which is about genetic diversity. Because in the 1960s, until uh, here at UCL, people started looking at protein variation, if you were interested in diversity, you could only work on a very limited number of creatures. Snails were one of them, because the snail I work on um, has differences in the color and the, and, the, uh, and the number of stripes or bands on its shell. They vary from very dark to very light, um, and uh, from pink to yellow, and from various other genetic differences. So we could go out and we could count genes in different populations. And what I found was, and nobody seems to have noticed, um, I did a lot of work in what's now Croatia, was then Yugoslavia, and which I chose because it was famous for having little patches of heat and cold. Uh, they're called frost hollows in the mountains, and of course you have them in mountainous parts of Russia. People will know that if you go up into the mountains in the morning, there's often a mist that sits in the valley bottom, and the peak is in sunlight, and that's because cold air rolls downhill, and it's much colder in the bottom. And what we found was that in the Yugoslavia, where we had this issue, all the snails at the bottoms of these valleys were dark, and those at the top, on the sides of the mountains were light. And we, worked, we did a lot of work on that, and it turned out that that was because um, the ones on the bottoms of the valleys needed to soak up more sunlight to get active in the morning because they were cold. The ones in the, on the tops of the valleys needed to keep the sun out because they got too hot. Okay. And I actually developed a paint uh, which is based on a, a, a blue dye that fades in sunlight, which we put into, uh, into a green paint, which makes a yellow paint, and then we put spots of this on the snails, and we watched it fade from green to yellow as the light of the sun broke down the blue dye. So we could look at the behavior of individual snails. Now that was, though I say it myself, fairly clever, and it got published in the journal Nature, um, and I did a lot more on it, but I'm not going to talk mainly about uh, snails, because people, for some reason, are not interested in them. So, uh, when I remembered it was the 50th anniversary of, uh, of the Abbey Road song, I thought, I tell you what, I'll write a book about it. And in fact, that book is now written. It's coming out in June of this year in English, June 2019. It's called Here Comes the Sun. And the subtitle of the book is How It, How it uh, Feeds Us, Kills Us, Heals Us, and makes us what we are. And I'm completely astonished about the, with the developments, recent developments, in the effects of sunlight on the human frame. Now we all, no, we, of course sunlight feeds us, because without sunlight we wouldn't have photosynthesis, we wouldn't have plants, we wouldn't have food. Um, but sunlight kills us too. Plenty of people die from heat shock. Um, I spent many years after the snail episode working in Death Valley in California. On, uh, on heat relationships in fruit flies in Death Valley. And there, if you're out in the sun in Death Valley, you can easily be killed. People are killed frequently in Death Valley, um, less so now because they have phones, uh, so they can call in a helicopter. Um, but it's easy to be killed by, by being too hot. Um, so, and people also know, of course, that you're killed, if you've got light skin, by skin cancer. That was discovered, that discovery, the skin cancer discovery, was made in the 1930s in the United States Navy, where in the U.S. Navy, uh, the, the physicians of the U.S. Navy decided to look at the health of their sailors compared to people who uh, worked on land. And they did that, and they found something quite striking, was that sailors had a high rate of skin cancer on their arms and on their faces and exposed parts of the body. And they died at quite a high rate from skin cancer. Now, that's because, of course, ultraviolet light can cause cancer. We all know that, and everywhere across the world, um, certainly in Britain, but certainly in southern Russia, in Australia, in New Zealand, people slap on this stuff to keep the ultraviolet out. 
and they're wise to do so. Uh, the highest rate of skin cancer in the world is in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, in Switzerland, where people go skiing, has a very high rate of skin cancer. I myself never sunbathe because of that, okay? Uh, because I believe it to be dangerous. And it is dangerous, but there's a forgotten aspect to this sunlight thing and health. What the American um, authorities in the 1930s found was that if you look at all cancers in their sailors versus people on land, the incidence of all cancers was only half in the sailors as it was in those on land. And in fact, it looks as if sunlight prevents cancer much more than it causes it. And the effect is big. The effect is not small. Um, many cancers are rare in sunny places and common in cloudy places. And it's not just cancer. There's a disease called multiple sclerosis, which is a nervous degenerative disease. Okay? And this means that the um, the uh, sheaths of your nerves begin to be eaten away by your own immune system and you begin to lose the power of movement and in the end you're kind of frozen like this and it's really, it's a, you can go blind, it's a terrible disease. Now this disease is quite common and it's common in the cloudiest parts of the world. Even within Canada, it's twice as common in northern Canada as it is in southern Canada. Even within Britain, it's four times as common in the northern islands of Britain as in the south of Britain and that's only about a thousand kilometers difference. So the effect is spectacular. This disease is almost unknown in the tropics. If you go to Australia, where most people are of European origin, the incidence of multiple sclerosis is half what it is in Europe. Though the genes are European, the climate is sunny. So the sun turns out to be an astonishing, um, astonishing agent of good health. And quite recently there's been a survey in, on Sweden which followed 50,000 women for five years and classified them for on their exposure to sunlight. And they had three groups, those who were very keen on sunbathing, perhaps used sunbeds and went to the Mediterranean on holiday, um, those who were moderately interested in sunbathing and didn't do much about it, and those who posited almost never went out and got no sun. They found for middle-aged women a th three-year difference in life expectancy between those two groups, the least sun and the most sun, and that's the same or more than those who smoke versus those who don't smoke. So that the scourge of the shadows is just as dangerous as the scourge of the cigarette which is completely unexpected. But what's even more unexpected is that it turns out that sunlight is very effective against infectious disease too, particularly tuberculosis. And tuberculosis still kills people across the world. It was the biggest killer of all in the 19th century. It's, st um, it's still quite common in parts of the world. It's common in parts of Russia still. Uh, it's coming back in Britain because people aren't taking precautions against it. Um, so it's a killer. For many years, um, it was treated with sunlight, and that's because there's a related condition, uh, which is a skin disease, uh, uh, which is horrible, disfiguring boils and pustules on the skin, which a Dane in 1904 discovered could be uh, could be cured with an ultraviolet light. Okay, and this was caused by a bacterium, which is the same bacterium as causes tuberculosis. So in the 1920s. The, uh, the fashion arose to take people with tuberculosis and put them in sanatoriums in Switzerland or in Britain where people had no money. Uh, the uh, school children were taken and given, taken to seaside hospitals where they were t told they had to lie, lie in the sun. When I was five, I sat under an ultraviolet light to give myself um, sunlight because it was said to be good for you and it was good for you. But how can sunlight kill a bacterium? Well, it kills the ones on the face because the bacteria don't like the ultraviolet light, okay? It just kills them like that. And indeed, if you go to a tuberculosis clinic, you will find that in the clinic there are ultraviolet lights everywhere to kill. As people cough out the bacterium, these things will kill the bacterium. But it goes more than that. What actually happens is that ultraviolet makes vitamin D in your skin. And vitamin D is known to be good for you in many ways, for your bones, for example, but it also um, turns out to attack um, infectious diseases. How does it do that? It generates a protein called catholicidin, which is a natural antibiotic in your body. So that if you're lying in the sun, 
um, you're doing exactly the same. Let's say you were doing it in a clinic in Switzerland in the 1930s, as in Thomas Mann, his famous book, The Magic Mountain, which is about people with TB, uh, dying of TB and trying to cure themselves with sunlight. Uh, you were actually taking an antibiotic 20 years before antibiotics were invented, okay? Because uh, your body makes that antibiotic in sunlight that cures your diseases. Even more so, um, if you go sunbathing, if I go sunbathing, I have to tell you I have a house in France where I spend a lot of time. And one of the reasons I go there is because I remember my experiences in Edinburgh. And Edinburgh, which is a very beautiful city, has less sunshine than any other city in Europe apart from Reykjavik in Iceland, okay? And I have vivid memories of the sun never coming out and getting more and more depressed and miserable because the clouds are always there and everybody going... And then the sun would come out and everybody go, oh, God, thank God for that, here comes the sun, okay? Uh, but actually what's going on is the sunlight, when it strikes your skin, is making hormones which make you happy. Right? Um, these are the hormones which give people a sense of, uh, of um, happiness when they've just finished a race. You know, their body is really toned up and they feel really great. They call it the rush. It's made by the sunlight on the skin. So what starts with snails in valleys in Yugoslavia ends with the psychology of happiness among the Scots. And that's the beauty of biology. It links such different things together so easily.